Hi, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Ashley Davidson, and I am the President and CEO of the Joseph Brandt Hospital Foundation, and we are thrilled to have um, with us this morning David Henderson and Ian Prera, Dr. Ian Prera, and we will be talking about planning your legacy one step at a time. Um, so to kick us off, I will hand over to our guests this morning to introduce themselves. So Dr. Prera, if you'd like to provide an introduction, that would be great, please. Good morning, I'm Ian. I am an emergency physician and the chief of staff at Joseph Brandt Hospital. I've been here since 2018, but I practiced eMERGE here before that time. Uh, and I'm the president of the College of Physicians and Surgeons. I'm delighted to uh, be with you today and I hope we get lots of questions and have a good discussion. Great, thank you Ian for being here this morning. David, over to you. Hi, David Henderson. I'm a lawyer and a partner at Agra Zafiro, which is a law firm, full service law firm in downtown Hamilton. Although my practice focuses on estate planning, state administration and uh, corporate law related to family business planning. So I, I tend to focus and uh, practice everywhere, basically west of Toronto with clients. Great. Thank you, David. So looking forward to having a really fulsome and interesting conversation this morning. Um, and David, I'll start with you. And before we discuss the first steps with respect to legacy planning and planning one's estate, can you talk to us, David, please, a little bit about why it's important for people to even consider planning legacy? And for those who have already done so, why it's important to revisit those plans from time to time? Yeah, I think to the to the first question, it's just about control and having having the ability to make your own decisions about everything you've worked for, whether it be assets or or relationships as well, like those that you've grown close to, whether it's family or friends, uh, organizations, to have control over how uh, like your legacy, what you leave to them, and how it is. We we have default legislation, uh, like most uh, most provinces, about where things go in the event that you don't have a will. It's called intestate. Uh, but that's very default. It's just sort of down the line of the of the subsections about where all your assets and who is entitled to eventually apply to administer your state. But the idea of like you work hard and you develop these relationships to be able to take control of that and actually uh, uh, through the through your will dictate who you want to have in charge of your affairs after you're gone and where you want your assets to go uh, is pretty important. I, I would add to <clears throat> you're the expert on sort of the dynamic of those parties and those assets and to be able to limit dispute. That's always a strong component too, is you may have people that you care for equally, but they just wouldn't be able to work together and they may need a third party. They may need to be distanced from each other with the way the administration is. All that goes out the window if you don't plan correctly with your own will and and use your expertise on the parties to address what you want in your will and leave it up to an intestacy. Uh, tax planning, that's another benefit as well. Um, but you know, more or less, it's, it's about the the idea of taking control and and seeing things through to the end of what you want to have done. As far as like the importance of reviewing, uh, that tends to be because like life is always moving, and and not just your life, but the people that you account for, those that you care for, their lives are changing too. So you'd be surprised how quickly when you go back and look at a will you did even just a few years ago, how maybe certain parties' relationship has grown, and you want to care for the uh, provide for them more. Other parties, there may be more distance there and they're not appropriate to be involved there. Um, and just, you know, it could be just as simple as people moving out of the out of the area and now you need someone else in place. Assets can change and there can be better tax planning to be done around that too. But uh, yeah, life is is always changing and people don't really want to make a priority of looking looking at their will. But um, it, it is a good idea to, to look at it and, and have it reviewed probably with professional every few years too. Great, thank you, David. Um, sometimes people will say to me that the process feels very complicated or overwhelming. So um, thinking about it sort of in more simple terms, where would you suggest that people could start? What would be a good first step in the process that people could consider? Yeah, if they, if they retain a professional lawyer, they're they're hopefully going to take them right from that initial step and not leave it to them. But there, there's something to the idea of like doing some planning in advance to feel more comfortable. And it, it really comes down to just like assessing your life which can be scary to try to put all your life on paper, but it's really about your, your net worth. You know, that's the, the crude part of like, what are your assets? What are your debts? What, what do you have there? What's the potential, you know, if you're getting, probably need some advisory help, but like, what's the tax ramifications of those particular assets. And then the other side is like, what are your relationships? Like 
what uh who do you care for what is your relationship with whether it's family friends organizations and sort of just like out mapping that all out too like who would you like to uh to care for um and once you've kind of done that and you can get a sense of it then you can sort of navigate um you know potentially with some um uh, the help of a lawyer to sort of look at well what makes sense what will run the smoothest how can i take care of those people that that i want to on the on the one column uh with the assets that i have on the other side and um you know the plans can be quite simple um you know especially if the assets are relatively modest it may be that you want to keep it to a small group of people if it's immediate family uh children that you want to take care of in equal shares but when you really like look at it all there, you may find there's more than I thought. There's the ability to think a little outside of that. And I can actually be a little bit more creative and hopefully with good you know, advisors, you can kind of get creative in ideas about uh, a secondary set of uh, beneficiaries, whether it be like extended family, friends, charities, and uh, also creativity and sort of how we protect the funds if there's the need for uh, protection for that, the people that you want to take care of, because um, you know that they may struggle with you. Uh, potentially not around to help uh, guide them through life. Right. Thank you, David. Um, I think we know another important aspect is selecting an executor or a trustee who would be able to carry out your wishes. Can you talk to us, David, please, a little bit about um, why that role is such an important piece of the puzzle and what to think about when selecting an executor or a trustee for the estate? Yeah, so it, it's a fun one when... <laughs> in this area to go over with because on, on the one hand there's like the you know the there's looking at the sophistication of the estate like just do does the person or in some cases you're looking at professional trustees like a trust company do they have the expertise to deal with your specific type of assets it's a lot a lot more work to deal with an estate frankly that has like an ongoing manufacturing company or several rental properties uh, than it is to deal with um, maybe someone that now has a very simplified life and just has a lot of investments and they're pretty clean and um, it's mainly just personally held assets. So the sophistication of the party you're thinking of to, to that would be your, your estate trustee, your executor to administer that really depends <clears throat> on one hand with what are those, uh, what are those assets that are going to make the estate quite complex. But the other side that is really the client is the most, uh, has the most expertise on is but beyond all of that, even if they are quite capable, are they the the specific right person for that job? And that has a lot to do with, do they understand personally what you're trying to achieve beyond just like what's going to be in this paper in this will? Like, do they have a sense of you? And also, how do they kind of work with the other beneficiaries? That can be an important one too. Like there's lots of conversations, hundreds I've had over the years where like there may be a, a child uh, that is more than capable of administering the estate, but they just don't get along. Maybe it's with the their siblings or the other people there. So it may, even though they're capable and they have the sophistication to administer an estate that we're talking about, they're just not the right person. Even even they would probably admit that sometimes they are saying, you know, mom, dad, don't put me in charge of this. Put like, you know, uncle so-and-so, put my cousin. Um, I know I could do it, but I think that'll just keep the peace better in the family if there isn't. It may just bring up... Uh, old wounds if uh, I'm in charge of that. And then sometimes it's a lot clearer where you just need like a professional trustee, like a, like a Royal Trust or a Canada Trust, like a trust company to step in and uh, take care of everything just because of the sheer like involvement. It's like a full-time job if there's a lot of uh, sophisticated assets or or the nature of the parties, if there's someone that doesn't have the capacity and, and there isn't really someone to manage that afterwards. Those would be sort of the main attributes you're trying to sort of balance when you make the decision it can be it can be like some people it's a five second conversation other people it's really tough to find that right fit great thank you david um ian i'm going to come to you next and talk a little bit about um sometimes a difficult topic but end of life care decisions um and if you could talk to us ian about the importance of a power of attorney and also in your experience um if someone should find themselves in hospital and unable to make those decisions for themselves. What happens then, Ian? Can you speak with us, uh, to us, please, about that a little bit? Yeah, so this, you know, I've, I've been doing Emerge since since I owned a hairbrush, which is a long, long time. And uh, it's very challenging sometimes to have someone come in who is acutely ill and can't express their own wishes. I mean, we've all seen it on TV shows, you know, the ambulance comes in, the person's unconscious, and and the default in eMERGE is to do everything possible, right? That's that's what we do. And uh, the challenge with that is, as an eMERGE doc, I don't know you. 
I don't really know all your history. I don't know your wishes, your beliefs, your preferences. And so if those aren't expressed, then it's very difficult for us to follow your wishes. And, you know, David was saying how important it is to choose a trustee who really gets you and understands what you would want. And the same thing holds true for a power of attorney for personal care. You really want someone who understands what your wishes would be in a circumstance. And some people may, in, at the end of life, want to make sure that they are comfortable. Some people would want every intervention possible. And the only way that the care team is going to know that is, is if there's someone to speak on your behalf, if you are not able to. And I think for, for the care team, having that person as the point of contact is critically important so that at the end of life, we can provide the care that you would have wanted. Were you able to speak for yourself? And I think, you know, the other thing, Ashley, is the process of appointing a power of attorney sometimes forces you to just sit down and have that conversation with the people you care about, because these are not topics that people talk about over dinner. You know, people want to know how the Leafs are doing. People want to talk about politics, but they don't want to talk about what their wishes would be in a circumstance that is going to come to all of us, but it's not something we want to think about. And I do, I do think that there's great value in having that conversation. And certainly, you know, so much care is provided at the end of life. And we really want to make sure that in that time of your life, that you are getting what you would want in the same way as if you were able to speak for yourself and make your own wishes known. Great. Thank, thank you, Ian. Yes, yeah, certainly those um, conversations are, are really, really important. And as you say, having them in advance before, you know, you're in a, in a situation where there's perhaps a heightened emotional state or, um, you know, having everyone sort of understand what you would want if you were able to make those decisions for yourself is, is really key. So um, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, David, I'm going to come back to you at this point. So in terms of actually formalizing documentation and having a will drafted and other supplementary documents, um, can you speak to us, David, a little bit about that process and what options it would exist for people? Yes, yeah, sure. Just uh, I'll, I have one quick point that you made a great point there, but the power of attorney is about, especially when in specific time of power of attorney for personal care, mm -hmm. it's really amplified the importance of someone that understands your wishes. Uh, you know, there's separate power of attorney appointments. There's power on a, on a basic sense, power of attorney for property, power of attorney for personal care, power of attorney for property. I, I often strong, strongly recommend it be consistent with the executors just because that tends to be what, well, that is while you're alive making financial decisions on your behalf. So it's a very similar skill set, but like completely different people often that are best suited to be your power of attorney for personal care. I've had many clients where, you know, they have a child that's, uh, you know, a, a lawyer, an accountant, business person, they are fully equipped to be the estate trustee and the power of attorney for property, but they have another sibling or or someone else in, uh, in the family that is much better suited just because of their sort of, usually it does come down to like similar philosophical beliefs mm -hmm. uh, or spiritual beliefs of the, of the testator, of the grantor. So uh, yeah, that's a, a good point. When it comes to POA for personal care, that is number one for sure is just how, how do they understand your wishes? Because in that moment, they're going to have to like put it in the context of the situation. Uh, to, to your uh, actual question, I just thought it was a good point by Ian. Uh, to your actual question about uh, the process, um, I always say like you you clearly don't need a lawyer to do a will. Obviously, I am a lawyer that does estate planning. I would recommend that uh, you seek professional advice, but it's like a lot of things in life. Like you could try to, you know, fix the plumbing yourself or you could hire a professional plumber. So um, the if there's any sort of relatively significant assets, or frankly, even if there isn't, but you really want to see through and ensure that you you are comfortable that you've retained someone that that has assured you they're doing it correctly, so you just ensure your plans are met afterwards, whether it be your your burial, your um, your funeral plans, um, and seeing through the last of your wishes, uh, even if you don't have significant assets, that really you should be leaning towards working with a professional. <clears throat> and at this this stage, I think. Most lawyers that are doing this work, they have an understanding that this doesn't mean just typing out a will. This is a much more holistic approach to like figuring out the plans of the client, which means back to, to what I said earlier, it's gathering all that information about the assets, gathering all the information with the family so they can issue spot and give proactive advice about, you know, things like you have certain assets that um, 
you've designated and they flow outside the will. You have certain assets that may attract tax that you didn't realize. That, you know, I use this example often as a because it sometimes is counterintuitive to people. You have a cottage and you have a child that is, uh, you know, you want to leave that cottage to. And in your mind, you think, well, that's fine because I have about the same amount of money and I'll just leave that to my my other child through the will. But the capital gains, which are often quite significant on a cottage, they're actually attract. They're actually paid out of the estate. So basically, the cottage goes uh, without some more sophisticated planning. The cottage goes free and clear to the one child. All the tax burden, hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially, is felt by that residue beneficiary, the other child. And we see so many disputes about that. Did mom or dad really understand that? So that's why it's important to just be getting like the full advice on your whole picture, because the whole goal of is really just to a mitigate dispute that things go smoothly because you are often as the testator the glue of the family holding people together and this this is you making sure that piece is kept afterwards um you know tax advice things like that as well come hand in hand with like getting professional advice but um yeah that's the process you know some some are quick some are long depending on the complexity great thank you david um ian i'm going to come back to you and you know, continue on our, our our thoughts around sort of end of life wishes and having conversations um, with our loved ones about what those wishes are. And Ian, could you give us um, some examples or um, some ideas about what people might want to talk about when they're having those conversations? What kind of wishes that they might want to consider? Yeah, for sure. And and you know, actually, one of the hardest things is actually initiating the conversation, right? Like, how do you do it? Yeah. And everyone knows their family best, right? Everyone knows how it's going to be received. Most families don't want to have this bombshell, you know, in the middle of Thanksgiving dinner about talking about their wishes. But oftentimes, these conversations occur over a kitchen table. And I think for your family, you have to make the best determination about how to have the conversation, but you need to have it. And one of the things that I think is helpful is making sure everyone who's everyone who you think needs to be there is there. Mm -hmm. Do it in person, and make sure everyone knows that that's why you're there. I'd like to, you know, and that can be as simple as saying, you know, after dinner you're having coffee or something, and saying, "Listen, I'd like to talk a bit about X, Y, and Z." And then the other time people have them is when they've received a diagnosis, right. and they're telling the family about the diagnosis. And then at the same time, talking about their wishes, that works sometimes. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people are just so shocked to hear the news that you may want to entertain a bit of a pause. Yeah. Um, and I think you need to make that judgment. But I would say having a scheduled, structured conversation with all the people that matter present is really important. And so what do you talk about? Well, it's not easy, but I think most people find, and conversations that I'm present often happen in the hospital, but most people find that it gets easier as you go because you're talking about things that aren't necessarily medical. You're talking about yourself mm -hmm. and you're talking about your wishes and what you would want. And so some of the questions you want to ask is, you know, who is the person that you want uh, to make those decisions when you can't? Uh, what kind of treatment do you want? Do you want to be on uh, a ventilator? Do you want to go to the intensive care unit? Um, what uh, medications do you want to use? Do you want to be made as comfortable as possible, knowing those medications might make you sleepy and less able to communicate? Or do you want aggressive treatment? Oftentimes, people come in and we have that discussion and their family finds out that, you know, that, that they have thought about this. They never communicated it to anyone. Right. And maybe they don't want to be in ICU and they don't want to have aggressive treatment and they don't want painful procedures. They want to be comfortable and they want to be able to be surrounded by their family and they and they want to pass. And sometimes people will express uh, that they want um, they want medical assistance in dying or made. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, this was something that I personally struggled with many years ago when it first came out. And now having experienced it um, both firsthand with people close to me, but also with innumerable patients, it is profoundly powerful and may be something that some people want to consider as being right for them, but it's not right for everybody. And so those are the kind of conversations that you want to have so that your care team can abide by your wishes 
and also make the necessary preparations, if, you know, so that you have the right people there. If they have people who are flying in from far away, they have time to get there. And also, you know, you often these conversations lead to conversations about what you want your loved one to know, mm -hmm. right? Things that you feel that you may not always express that, you know, this is a great opportunity to say that I'm proud of you or to say, I'm sorry for some silly event that occurred 20 years ago. That's been, uh, you know, an ongoing topic of conversation. So these are great conversations. They're valuable. They're healing. They help direct care teams in the future. Uh, and they really, I think, can bring families closer together once you get over that initial awkwardness. Great. Thank you, Ian. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, certainly takes um, the burden off of, right, those people who are trying in these difficult situations to make the best decisions possible to just be sort of very clear and have a real understanding of, you know, trying to act um, in, in, of course, the best interest of the person they're making decisions for, but also trying to make the decisions that that person would want to have made for themselves. So I see yeah. that conversation as, you know, a real, a real kindness and a real alleviation of potential burden to those people who are, you know, want to make those uh, the very best decisions for their loved ones. Yeah, actually, you know, I'll tell you, we've all, I think, seen it, that when someone is gravely ill, it's a stressful time. People aren't their best selves. Family members are not their best selves. Yeah. And, you know, how many times have we seen it in our own lives that things are said and done in, during the passing of a loved one that go on to damage families for years after? And I think being prepared helps ameliorate that and, and can help families get through a really difficult time together rather than being at odds with one another, trying to make decisions mm -hmm. where everyone is in good faith, trying to do what they think is right, but they just have different opinions as to what, what that is. Right. Right. Thank you. And I think, you know, this conversation hopefully will um, allow some of um, some of our donors and some of our community who are watching today to think about how they might have those conversations with their own family. So thank you, Ian. That's great. Um, I'm going to, you know, sort of switch themes a little bit here, David, and talk about um, another component that people consider when making their legacy plans or crafting their estate plans. And that's um, choosing a, you know, sometimes a charitable beneficiary of a portion of, um, or, you know, sometimes all of an estate, depending on a family's situation. So hoping, David, you could chat with us a little bit about um, different ways that individuals can leave a gift to a charity and what those steps are um, to take. And then perhaps chat a little bit about what's more in, impactful, a monetary gift, like a, um, a certain amount of money, or whether or not the percentage of an estate is something people might want to consider. Yeah, so I, I would break it down into four basic ways that uh, people can provide to a charitable organization uh, through uh, at death. Uh, obviously, the, the other very common is to just give while you're alive. And often that is done, especially if you have some significant assets in a strategic manner where you're looking at a large, you know, the, the goal is still obviously to help, but it's nice to also time that with, your accountant will tell you this, it's very nice to time that with a large taxable event, uh, whether it's the sale of a business or an asset to then also give it that time. But be beyond that, the act, the idea of giving upon your death for, I'll go from uh, least, least common in a sense to most common. So there is the ability to designate the beneficiary on certain types of assets. So these would be like your registered plans, like a TFSA, which you know every year grows in the amount that can be put in there. You can put a charity, just like you can put an individual directly on there as a beneficiary. Same for RIF, same for uh, life insurance is a very common one too, I guess, out of those those assets would be a common one for a charity to be listed. Um, the benefit of that is sort of completely separate from the will that's involved, the estate trustee or anything. It's just sort of out there on its own and just finds its way to the charity um, <clears throat> for the most part. The next one would be um, the the gift of a specific asset. So actually leaving an asset to the, the charity. Again, under the will, this one would be though, but it would be stating I leave X to, uh, to uh, this charity. That typically, you know, what assets make sense for that? It's usually publicly traded shares. There's a added tax benefit to that too. There's a, sort of this double tax benefit that, um, you know, I'm not going to get into all of that, but essentially means that you're, um, if there's major gains on those shares that you have, you avoid for your estate, you um, you do not have the gains on that, but also get the, the taxable uh, receipt 
to then be used against potentially other taxes. So that's a real uh, advantage. And that's when you see more common than obviously like I'm sure a charity wouldn't turn down receiving a cottage, but that's not the type of personal asset you typically see being given to a charity. Um, and then the two most common, I put them side by side, which you were alluding to is like a cash legacy, like a lump sum of cash being given and uh, a share or the whole of the residue. The residue is like the, the catch all, like what's there after all the debts have been paid and funeral and taxes and then what's left in there. Uh, what makes sense is the whole benefit of like looking at the whole plan and making sure that makes sense. In, in general, the cash legacy amounts tend to be smaller. And a lot of that is just because that's good planning that they are paid first. So if you have a, you know, an estate, uh, you know, when you factor in your real estate, everything that's slightly over a million dollars, if you leave a legacy of a large legacy, like a half a million or $700,000, you have to really understand that depending on your life and if you go into private care and the cost of all that, there may be only enough to pay that legacy or not at all, meaning that the residue beneficiaries aren't looking at anything. So that's why we're always trying to be very conservative and careful about the amount you leave as those lump sum cash legacies mm-hmm. um, versus the residue, which is like it's high ceiling, high uh, floor as far as you know where that'll end up uh, or low floor as far as what that amount will end up being because that's just the net after all that other stuff is done. So if you had a very, uh, you know, very successful financially uh, latter half of your life and that residue portion essentially keeps growing. So if you left the charity 25% of that, they're going to see that continued growth. Um, so it really depends on sort of, uh, you know, what, what the goal is there. If the charity is really viewed as like a primary consideration alongside the other beneficiaries, maybe the only one residue, of course, if they're more of a secondary, like, you know, I, I got care at this place or my someone close to me did. And I really want to like, honor that, then that's usually more of a place for like a hundred thousand, you know, pick a number, but like a, a lump sum cash. It also is cleaner from an administration standpoint, as far as um, if they are a secondary beneficiary, that is just, they get their money and then that's the extent of it rather than reporting uh, when they're uh, a residue beneficiary. I'll, I'll add one other comment that's related, but a separate is remainder beneficiaries. Uh, more and more, we see more sophisticated, you know, in my world, more sophisticated planning where there are trusts being set up. Most common we talk about is like a trust for someone that um, that uh, needs protection for their lifetime for whatever reason, you could spend thrift, um, uh, dis- disability, whatever the case is, uh, with proper planning, you have to account for what happens on the date where that person passes away if there's still money in that trust. And that's a remainder beneficiary. And that's one we see commonly for charities as well, because that's that event could be so far in the distance that the benefit of a charity especially with the proper language to allow replacement charities that there's, they're going to be there. And that way you can ensure that money still finds itself to us, to an organization that you believe in often related maybe to the person, the money's being taken care of because you know that they were, you know, in need of, if it's uh, medically related, they're in need of service. So what better place than to have that kind of go off to mm-hmm. a foundation that supports uh, their care. Great. Thank you, David. Um, we've also had a question from our audience regarding Henson trusts. David, so this might be a good opportunity if you would um, give us some information and background on what those are and, and what their function is. That would be very helpful. Yeah, so Henson Trust is is the name we've given uh, here in Ontario to uh, a particular type of a particular type of absolute discretionary testamentary trust, which means a trust you're you're setting up typically uh, in the will, where it's the absolute discretion of the trustee as to what goes out for the benefit. So think of it as terms of. The trustee has complete control over the over the funds that go into the trust, as long as they're always used for the benefit of the beneficiary, who is, in this case, someone that is typically the, well, is on ODSP, is on government assistance. And by using that language where it's absolutely discretionary, meaning that the beneficiary can't say, well, you have to pay me $2,000 every month, any sort of locked in language like that, that discretion means that from uh, the government assistance standpoint, the assets of the trust are not considered the assets of the beneficiary, meaning that they will still continue to qualify for o- ODSP or whatever government assistance they're on. Um, that's the basic idea. It is very nuanced. And I, I do like doing a lot of that work because it also like a lot of it is about the personal, the personal qualities. Like lots of people can be on government assistance and they are more than capable of maybe managing or at least have capacity to do that. So that's a very different dynamic than someone where they have never had capacity to this, uh, the disability has been there since birth. And um, those in a sense, you know, just they would have needed absolute discretion anyways, because you need someone else to make all those, those choices. And there's a lot of exemptions that if you're really taking the time to think about it, um, 
you know, like a home is an exemption. So for some people, that may be something that um, if the child is capable, the meaning exemption to to excluding them from government assistance. So mm -hmm. maybe you'll want to ensure that funds will go out for a house in some way by communication, communicating that to the tr the trustees. Uh, RDSPs have become a really popular vehicle as well, which again is an exemption. You can set up the RDSP, that's a disabled, uh, registered disabled plan, um, disability plan, and set that up for them. So, you know, it's a, you got to look at the whole picture. And I, I did say earlier too, like, it's also very important if you're setting up a Henson Trust for your 20 year old child, we're talking hopefully, you know, 50, mm -hmm. 60, 70 years until they pass away someday. So what does it look like at the end of that, where there's presumably still going to be all this money accumulating, or at least the capital in, or potentially the capital in there, uh, who's going to get all that afterwards. And that can get a little tricky because maybe all the people they're the youngest of all the people that are important in your life. So there, there may not be anyone there. And that's where conversations uh, revolve around maybe a, a charity or, or a, a whole group of extended family members that can all take a, a piece of that at that point. Great. Thank you, David. Um, carrying on, you know, with the charitable component <laughs> of legacy planning, Ian, I know in your work um, as a physician here at the hospital, you oftentimes see, you know, the benefit of these charitable charitable gifts that the foundation receives and that the impact that those gifts can have on patient care here at our hospital. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about that, Ian? That would be great. Yeah, I mean, like the fact of the matter is we couldn't do this work, right, without the philanthropy of the community. That's just the realities of the healthcare system. Um, you know, I think many people feel like, oh, the government provides for all the funding we need to run the hospital. And I think anyone who opened the paper or checked their Twitter feed or looked on Facebook realizes that that isn't the case. And especially for those areas um, that require capital investment, things like MRI machines or neonatal baby warmers or tools that we use in the operating room, monitoring equipment, you know, those are the things that where the need is most urgent because the the government doesn't provide funding for that and hospitals are expected to raise that money from the community which i think is pretty shocking to uh to members of the community i think for me if i think about giving you want to give to a cause that's important to you that is going to impact the people you care about especially your own uh community and that is gonna leave a legacy that will honor the story you told in your life, the story of you know, generosity and caring for others um, and being engaged in the community. And you know, I think over the years, uh, the JBH has benefited from over $39 million in, in just legacy gifts from people who, who wanted to give a gift um, in, in, their, in their will. And, you know, I'll give you an example. Howard and Betty Geis, you know, many people who are watching this will have, will know uh, that they uh, donated money to our ophthalmology or eye, eye health care clinic. So the new ophthalmology department that we'd redevelop, I doubt that there's anyone listening who hasn't known someone who's impacted by it. Because what it meant is that instead of having to go elsewhere for eye-preserving surgery, like cataract surgery, mm -hmm. They can have that done close to home but it also has allowed us to reduce the wait time for that surgery and you know anyone who's uh who knows someone who's had eye problems or cataract where they can't see it has a profound impact on the quality of your life i mean close your eyes and try and live your daily life and you can see exactly how impactful it is and when people have this surgery their vision's restored like that and their life changes like that and it means they can see the faces of their grandchildren and be independent in their homes and go back to doing so many of the activities that make life worthwhile. And, and so I think that kind of legacy in the community that the Geist family has left uh, mm -hmm. is going to impact so many thousands of people and their families. And, and it can be such a comfort to those you leave behind to know that your good works continue and you're passing. And, um, and I, I think that's very valuable. And certainly to us at the hospital, we, we couldn't do this work without the generosity of our donors. And so um, it does really make a profound uh, a difference. And, um, and it's so deeply appreciated by the, by the staff. Absolutely, Ian, thank you. 
Um, we've got another question from our audience, um, just wondering what some of the current and most urgent priorities are of our hospital at the moment. Yeah, so we were delighted uh, just two days ago to hear about the ministry support for our mental health and addictions project. So that is a huge deal for us. It's something that we've been working together with our partners and the ministry and government uh, to, um, to really accomplish because everyone knows there's such a need in the community and there's so many patients who are really crying out for this service. And our care team is a team of fantastic individuals who are providing great care despite the space that they're in rather than care that's facilitated by the space. And it'll allow us to move to a mental health program that is open and more connected to the community and really not focused on custodial inpatient care but getting people back where they belong, with their families, in their homes, at their jobs, enjoying their lives. You know, I will say you, you, we built this hospital and moved in in 2018. And at that time, there was a capital investment in equipment. But that equipment is getting to the end of its life. And if you think about things that are in your own house that are from, you know, before 2018, um, you know, these are pieces of equipment we use every day and they wear down and they break down. And our biomed team does a great job of MacGyvering them to keep working. But, uh, but these are also things that we need to reinvest in to make sure that we have the best equipment uh, to provide care and that our physicians, nurses, and allied health professionals have all the stuff they need to provide great care to our community. And I think a great example is our MRI machine, yeah. right? Our new MRI machine, um, if you look at the images compared to the old machine, the diagnostic accuracy, the speed, the amount of time that you have to be in the tube with the banging in your head, if you've ever had an MRI, you know, all that's reduced. The total breast care clinic, you know, we have state-of-the-art imaging uh, that allows our radiologists to detect cancers much earlier and which may save people uh, major surgery or chemotherapy or give them the best chance of survival. And so that's the impact of capital equipment, right? If you have the best people working with the best equipment, it's just natural that you're gonna have the best outcomes. And that's what we're aiming for here. Absolutely, and thank you, that's great. Um, David, I'll move back to you at this, um, at this point. We've had another question from our audience, and this one is about, um, you know, sort of the most common mistakes perhaps that you've seen with respect to estate planning and how those can be avoided. What do you see in your um, sort of day-to-day, -day, David, that pops up? Yeah, so if we're talking about wills uh, not not done with a, a lawyer, like the execution can be very finicky about what's required with respect to the two witnesses and mm -hmm. the, the, the signing of it. Um, there's actually been some recent changes in our law where we have loosen the technicality of that it still means you're, that you know upon your death someone's applying to try and have your will validated because of the the errors in its uh, execution but that's you know that's one i unfortunately see on the admin side where i wasn't involved in the the planning um related to you know more with what are what are some things that maybe could have used a little bit more thought i would say that the contingent beneficiary nobody wants to think about that i it's I, I'll commonly, I'm doing the first will, I'll give an example with a young couple, they're excited they had their first or they have a couple of kids and we're talking about all this and they want to, they're, they're motivated, they want to talk about who the guardians are, they're, they're comfortable talking about their death because this is why they're there, they're all, they're all prepared for that, we talk about who would be the guardian, who would be in charge of the trustee of the, the money for the minors. But then I throw the curveball of, well, what, you travel everywhere with them. The likelihood right now at that age of both of you passing in an accident, they're probably with you and their you know, jaw drops. Like what an awful, awful thing to, to think about. But it's a reality, a very rare remote situation, but one that, you know, that, that sort of planning. And, and honestly, in a less remote sense, just if you're leaving shares to each of your children, what happens if one of them predeceases you? We don't want to think about that, but is there proper uh, gift over language? And is it drafted correctly? Because there's a lot of specific rules around lapsing um, that you know require that thought. Getting it right on the first, if everyone's alive and healthy, this is where it all goes. That part's a little easier, but without like, you know, real thought into it and, and experience, frankly, from a professional, are you planning around what happens when this person dies? All these sort of contingency situations. And the other thing I would kind of add is, 
that's gotten better over the years I've been practicing. I've only ever practiced in this area is there is, I think more, more awareness now from, uh, again, I'll, specifically with parents but i guess in, in general when you're talking with your family it could be nieces nephews more awareness about the limitations of the generation you're you're leaving wealth to i think it typically used to be when i started practicing that older generation of like well everyone gets treated equally and they just get an amount whereas now we're getting into more like that's not something there my my one i love them to bits but my one child is susceptible to undue influence they are going to be taken advantage of they're going through a marriage that is on and off again every every couple of years and the idea of putting the money in their hand they are going to be you know we can do protections but if it's in their hand it's going to be split with the spouse and a little bit more like not just uh brushing it under under the rug those concerns and actually taking them head on having creative conversations about well we can still provide for them equally but maybe it's to their benefit that we put it in a trust that's accessible but it's also protecting from some of these things so that's one that's gotten better but it's still you know are those conversations happening as much as they should probably not great thank you david um we've also got a question in terms of information on legacy planning so i would encourage our audience today if you'd like more information um, please visit our website at jbhfoundation.ca. And also there you'll find information about how we recognize and celebrate um, our donors who provide legacy gifts to the foundation. We have a Joseph Brandt Society um, and certainly, um, you know, all donors who inform us if they choose to inform us that they've left a gift in their will. Uh, we respect those wishes around anonymity, anonymity confidentiality, um, but we would also love to celebrate generosity and recognize our donors um, and get to know those who have left gifts to us. So I would encourage people to visit the website to learn more. Um, any closing thoughts, Ian or David, as we um, sort of finish up our conversation today? I think this has been a really interesting, thought-provoking conversation, um, and I think it'll give our audience, um, you know, lots to chat about with their own families and lots to think about when they, you know, consider their own estate plans and their own legacy wishes. So thank you both. Closing thoughts, David, today? Just a comment I make uh, regularly because I hear it is the thought of doing your estate planning is way more painful than doing the estate planning. It's the, oh, we really need to get this time of year, especially it's always on everyone's New Year's resolutions. We really need to like look at our wills again or, or get wills. We don't even have wills. Right. Those those conversations are painful once you just engage, get it over with and then can kind of rest assured and, and move on with all the wonderful things of life that that is i constantly hear that at the end like oh that wasn't too bad it's like yeah it's not it's not, it's not the worst thing in the world once we get through it so yeah just just get it over with to an extent and then you can go back to not thinking about uh some of these these uh things for sure great thanks david ian any closing thoughts from you today yeah i, I think thanks for having uh having me here today ashley and these conversations with your loved one are an investment in the future happiness of your family. Mm -hmm. And the first five minutes of the conversation is, can be very difficult, but then the dialogue will pay dividends. And in addition to whatever gifts you make and whatever philanthropy you do, like that investment of your time will pay dividends for your family for a generation. And I think so many people are worried, worried about, you know, what's going to happen with the conversation, but also worried about, you know, exactly the things that Dave was talking about, you know, is, is my son going to be okay? Who's going to take care of, uh, of my daughter who's disabled? Um, is someone going to continue the work that I want uh, that's so important to be around mental health and addictions and having those enabling conversations, let's, let's the people you care about honor you even when you're gone and have your legacy and your family live on. And I think that that's very, very important. And I think it's something, you know, where a few minutes today mm -hmm. uh, can can pay dividends that last, last forever. Yep, you're absolutely right, Ian. Thank you. Um, thank you again, Ian. Thank you, David, for taking the time this morning to share your expertise and your perspectives with us. Um, really great conversation and very, very helpful for our audience and others. Um, and I'll let everyone know that the recording of today's um, webinar will be available on our website, again, at jbhfoundation.ca. Um, and we'll also send the link out to our participants following today's webinar. So thank you again to our audience. Thank you again, David. Thank you, Ian, for joining us this morning. Really appreciate it and great to see you both.